So here we're maximizing over all positive Cs. We have a function that's concave in C, so that's just a concave maximization problem. There are no constraints. So we know that a necessary um, and sufficient condition for a global optimum to this maximization problem is just to take, uh, you know, is that the, the derivative of the function is zero. Uh, since our function is concave, that gives us not only a local maximum, but also a global, uh, global maximum. Um, so we can uh, take uh, the first order condition here. So uh, a necessary and sufficient condition uh, <coughs> for the optimal C that is here the optimal C is C maximizing utility. Um, so our necessary and sufficient condition is that the derivative uh, is going to be uh, equal um, to zero. So here if I call um, you know, our function here I look at our function here and I take uh, derivative equal to zero. Um, so basically, your first order condition is also it's not only necessary here, it's also sufficient. So if I take the derivative uh, of the function here, what do I get? So um, first we take the derivative of the first term with respect to C, so we are going to get this, um, our scalar here, key over 1 plus key, then we get the exponent, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, if I'm not mistaken, yes, and then C minus 1 over epsilon, uh, yes, because I have 1 minus uh, 1 over epsilon, so once I take 1 out of minus 1 over epsilon, so this is the first term, second term, Let's take the derivative here. So first we have to take the derivative of this linear term inside, which just give us minus one plus tau x. So I can get rid of this. So I have a minus one plus tau x. And then I take um, the derivative of our um, power function. So I get first one one plus key, then I get epsilon minus one over epsilon, and then we get the whole linear term in C to the power of minus one over epsilon. Okay, uh, and that has to be equal to zero. This is our necessary intuition condition for the optimum. Uh, so a couple of things that we can do here to uh, simplify things. So let's simplify quickly. So first we have two epsilon minus one over epsilon here. We can get rid of them. Uh, we can multiply both sides by one plus key. So this is gonna uh, disappear. Another thing that we notice here is that this whole term, so let me uh, write the whole term out just in case that's useful. So that's just taking it from up there, yes. So we are, this is just mu over p plus f times k minus 1 plus tau times c. But this, of course, um, through the budget constraint, that's just equal to m over p. So I, I could plug just m over p here. So then if I want to find an expression for the, uh, what I'm looking for, right, is here the optimal c. I'm looking for the level of consumption that maximizes utility. That's really the key decision that households make. So if I do that, uh, here, uh, that's what I'm looking for. So I can take, uh, I would have a key here, C minus one over epsilon, and I bring everything else on the right hand side. I get one plus tau x times M over P minus one over epsilon. Okay, so 
this is our condition uh, for optimality. Uh, and so, you know, essentially, this is just saying that, uh, you know, the uh, household is going to equalize the marginality of cons marginal utility of consumption on the left hand side and the marginal utility from holding money on the right hand side, but taking into account the fact that um, if you buy one unit of, of service, um, you're going to pay it one plus tau x times p, whereas to buy one unit, uh, whereas one unit of uh, real uh, money uh, is going to cost p. So the one plus tau x here that appears is, uh, you know, it's, it's due to the fact that we have this uh, matching cost to pay for services. So it appears um, at a co as, a, as a cost of services relative to holding money, uh, because to hold money you don't, you know, you, you don't need to pay any matching, uh, any matching cost. Um, so um, just to interpret this optimality condition, so this here, this term is basically proportional to the marginal utility. MU of services, this term here, that's proportional to the marginal utility of real money balances. Or if you want the marginal utility of real wealth, because in this model, um, you know, wealth is just money, there's no other way to store your wealth. Um, and this here, um, which is uh, one plus the matching wage, that's um, essentially, effectively, um, the re uh, relative price of services. I mean, it's the price of services. Sorry, I should um, say it like this, express it like this. So this is the price of services relative to uh, real money balances. So this is our relative price. And so the marginal utilities are equalized, but you know, um, accounting of course uh, for the fact that, um, the, you know, taking into account the, also the fact that um, you have a relative price of services. So the ratio of the two marginal utilities has to be equal to the relative price uh, of the two goods. Uh, that's a typical uh, optimality condition here. Um, and so that, that's, uh, that's what we have here. So that's the interpretation uh, as it's completely standard in the utility maximization uh, problem. Uh, and then what we can do is uh, just rework this a little bit to have an expression for the consumption of services, which is what we were uh, looking for. So if we just rewrite this, uh, what do we get? So we get that <coughs> C minus one over epsilon is equal to one plus tau x divided by uh, T, and then we have M over P minus one over epsilon. Um, and then what we can do is multiply and take both the left hand side and the right hand side to the power of minus epsilon. And then once we do this, we get that C is equal to uh, well, uh, K <coughs> One plus tau x. This is going to be the power of epsilon, and then here I'll just get m over p. So this is the relation between the household's uh, consumption of services and real money holding at the optimum when the household has made uh, the optimal decision. Okay, uh, so this is how these two things are related. Now, this can be actually simplified uh, a little bit. Um, so this is if we look at one household, but then this can be simplified a little bit, this expression for the demand for services uh, once we step back um, and look at what happened at the macro level. Um, so <clears throat> this is something that 
we're going to do uh, when we want to re-express this condition here um, in terms of an aggregate demand. Uh, we'll be able to uh, use uh, what happens to the budget constraint across all households to simplify this a little bit. Um, before we do that, a uh, couple of things that uh, I want to know. So first, um, a couple of properties. Uh, we have a couple of properties here um, of uh, the demand for services that we can see. So um, but I guess these things will pop up more nicely once we look at the aggregate relationship. Um, but one thing I want to mention is that here we get a demand for consumption of services. And you know, so you may be confused, but what about the visits? How do we know how many visits the household do? How, how about expenditure or purchase of services? How do we know how many services they actually purchase? Here we just know how many they, how many they consume. But once you know how many services are consumed, it's very easy to back out all the rest of the behavior of the household. Like the household will just make one decision, how many services I want to consume. And from that, you know, you infer how many visits they have to do and how much they have to buy. And of course, you can re-express that. You could say they make one decision, which is to determine how many visits, then back out consumption expenditure. Or you could say they only decide how many services to buy and then back out consumption and visit. All these three things are isomorphic. So here you can, you can see that very clearly. Um, so we have C that the consumption of services, and I computed this because that's what enters into the utility function. But then we know that uh, the number of services purchased, which is not the same as the one that's consumed, it's, you can call it y, we know that it's always 1 plus tau x times c. And we know that because we know that anytime you want to consume one service, you've got to buy more than that. And in fact, for any one service that you consume, you've got to buy one plus tau x service. So if you want to consume C, you have to buy one plus tau x times C. Uh, so if I tell you C, the optimal consumption, you can immediately back out uh, the number of, of services that are purchased by the household. Uh, so these two things, you know, they are directly related. And of course, the household takes the tightness as given. So the household can compute C as easily as Y. Um, and then if you want to figure out the number of visits, by the household, well, that's very easy too, because we know that each visit is successful with probability Q of X. And so if the household wants to buy Y unit of services, then the household needs to, de to do Y over Q of X visit so that with the probability of success Q of X, you do buy these Y uh, services. So the number of visits, we know V, it's just going to be Y divided by Q of X, uh, because we know that, <clears throat> and that will give you, that uh, that will ensure that the household actually buys Y services. And if you want to express it as a function of uh, C, the consumption, you can also do that. So it's going to be equal to C times one plus tau X, divided by Q of X. Okay, and again, because the household takes the tightness as given, it's very easy once you know how many services you want to consume to back out how many visits you're going to do. Okay. Um, So the key point is that all these three things are, uh, are it's exactly equivalent to formulate the problem in terms of C or Y or V for the household, given that the household knows X, all these things are, you know, co-determined. Um, okay, so here we're going to focus on C because that's what matters for welfare, that's what matters the utility, but you could think of the problem in terms of Y or V um, as well. Uh, 